Okay, Bismillah everyone. We are still in Iznik. It's a beautiful morning. Okay, and uh, this is the last place we're going to see in Iznik. What is behind me uh, are the remains. These are the remains of Constantine's summer palace. Constantine the Great would come here and he would stay at this summer palace from uh, Constantinople and now Istanbul. Okay, so what you can see uh, are some blocks that are left. Unfortunately, much of the palace has been uh, destroyed over time or vandalized, unfortunately. You can see it is literally on top of the lake. And I'm assuming the water was uh, quite far from here initially. And later on, uh, uh, you know, water reached the palace. And this is why the basilica is underwater as well. We will look at the basilica. So if you keep walking with me, inshallah. Okay. So I don't know what Senato Sarai, Sarai um, represents. So this wall, if you can see, it goes through the towards the city, right? This wall was connected to the city. You can see, yeah, you can see all these blocks. They are the remains of, or the remnants of the palace of Constantine, who was a very important emperor, one of the most important figures in Roman history, and of course in Christian history, because he's the one who convened the Council of Nicaea. Now we're gonna see a very important site. I don't think we'll be able to see it, it's underwater. But we can see some of, some of the, the foundations uh, on the surface, inshallah. It's a tourist site now. It's a very beautiful city, Iznik, ancient Nicaea. And it's a beautiful lake. People come to the lake to relax with families. And we are walking towards the remains of the basilica and i will explain in a bit more detail why this basilica or why these foundations are so important in the history of humanity uh, there is a lot happening here there is a lot happening here okay so once we get close inshallah we will explain more if you zoom in there you can see those rocks where the birds are sitting and just behind the birds, you see some foundations. If you keep following, inshallah. Right, so you could see how long it took us from the palace to this place, about two minutes maybe walking. And I want to explain now what this place is. It's cordoned off, you can see they have put boundaries there and we're not, we're not gonna go very far, we're not gonna go in the sun, we're gonna stay in this shadow. Okay everyone, so these are the foundations of a very important basilica. We know it's important because of the size and because of the vicinity. The vicinity is right next to, literally like two minutes walk from Constantine's palace, okay? And Constantine's palace is maybe about 100 meters or maximum 200 meters from here. And this is the basilica, okay? We know this was a basilica because of the shape and it's underwater now. Now, there is this very, uh, a church, right? this is the church. Yeah, basilica means the church. Okay. Now this, there is this opinion that this is the very site of, um, this is the very site of um, the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea where 
the nature of Christ was discussed by Christian bishops. These were the most learned minds in Christendom at the time, in the early 4th century. This council took place in the year 325 CE. Constantine, when he made Constantin Constantinople his capital, he wanted to make peace between Christian factions because Christians were fighting each other over creed, over belief, over Akida, for example, right? So this is why they were brought together from all over the Christian Empire or the Roman Empire and they debated for days, days upon days, what is Christ? Well, that is just for uh, 325. No, for uh, this is, the Trinity is not formalized yet. The Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity is not formalized yet. There are people who already believe in it in some shape or form, but it's not fully documented, not fully formalized, not established yet. So they are still debating who is Jesus Christ? What is his place in, uh, in their religion, for example? Uh, is he God with capital G? Is he God with lowercase g? Is he uh, God like God the Father, the Creator? Is he another person in Godhead? Or is he just a human being who was created by God and he's a prophet of God, he's a supreme agent of God on earth, giving the message of God to humanity? All of these points were discussed here and there were huge differences between bishops. Some Christian bishops, they believed that Jesus is God like God the Father and he is one person in the same being of God, Godhead. So there is one being and this being is actually shared by at least two persons, if not three, because the third person is not the point of discussion at this stage in 325 CE. The third person will be discussed 50 years later in Constantinople, in the Council of Constantinople in 381 CE. Okay, and that council was uh, convened by uh, Theodosius, okay, Emperor Theodosius later on. And this is when the doctrine of the Trinity finally is defined. Okay, what we, we, we call it uh, the uh, uh, Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. In the Christian theology, in Christian history, this creed that was formalized in 381, 50 years after this, uh, is called Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed. Basically, the Creed of Nicaea and the Creed of Constantinople put together became the Nicene Creed, which... The which creed no, three, almost 400 years after Jesus, almost 400 years after Jesus, a belief is formalized by bishops and then it's forced upon the population. And most people actually did not believe in this. They were quite confused. If not confused, they had the belief that Jesus is definitely not God with capital G. God with lowercase g was not too much of a problem. In the, in the ancient world because that that could mean an, uh, an agent of God or demigod or someone of lower status to God. Uh, to the Roman world, that's not a problem because they already believe in many God-men, right? Apollo, Minerva, Jupiter, Zeus, Her Heracles. You see all these people depicted on Roman coins or Greek coins, right? But for the Christians to come up with this belief was shocking. And many of these Christians, they came from this Greek Roman background. And for them to believe in this, to believe in another man God wasn't a big deal. Okay, for the Jewish people, this was absolute outright blasphemy, it was kufr. So what happened here, what happened here in 325 CE, okay, where Jesus was declared to be God with capital G, God, as in God the Creator, or He is part of God the Creator, He is of the same essence. This was the conclusion here, that Jesus Christ is as God, as God the Father is, with capital G. They are of the same being, but two different persons. This was the conclusion here, which is absolute shirk. It is, it is polytheism, it is ascribing partners to God, okay? And going against all the teachings of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, when a Jewish man came to Jesus Christ, and he asked him, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, we are told, a Jewish man came to Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, and he asks him, Master, what is the first commandment? What does Jesus tell him? Behold, okay, there is one God, 
and this one God is basically represented by two persons. I am that person, Jesus Christ, and God the Father is another person. He didn't do that. He didn't say that. He tells this Jewish man, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Worship thy Lord with all thy mind, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. These are the words of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ to this Jewish man. This was the right time to tell him, hold on a second, actually there are two persons or three persons, let's say, because later on they would become three persons, right? God the Father, God the Son, which is me, and God the Holy Spirit, an unknown entity, right? There are three persons, but he didn't do that. He simply declares one God, right? And who do, how many, how many persons does the Jewish man have in his, in his mind? When the word God is mentioned, who does he have in his mind? One God, one being, one person, right? And at times the Jews called him the Father as well, the Creating Father, the Creating Father with capital F. But Jesus endorses his belief. He tells him, you know, there is only one God. The one, the one you have in your mind is the true God, right? And there are many verses in the old, uh, in the New Testament. For example, the Gospel of John, chapter seventeen, verse three, where Jesus said that father is the only true god if the father is the only true god then jesus is not a true god <laughs> if he's god but he's not god he never claimed to be god so what happened here was basically absolute it was a travesty it was an advance on what jesus has taught jesus never taught this this was purely the making of hellenic thinkers people who were very influenced by G greek philosophy and then amazingly the quran alludes to it quran actually addresses the creed of nicaea directly how in chapter 5 surah al, surah al maida allah says a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem laqad kafara alladhina qalu inna allah huwa al-masih ibn maryam wa qala al-masih ya bani israil u'budu allah rabbi wa rabbakum innahu man yushrik billah faqad harrama allah alayhi al-jannah wa ma'wahu an-nar wa ma lid-dhalimina min ansar this is the quran those are blasphemers who say that Jesus is God. Another verse, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ Those are blasphemers who say God, Allah, the Creator, is one of the three. Allah Akbar, directly, the Quran addresses this very spot, this very uh, uh, conclusion that was formalized here in 325c almost 1700 exactly 1299 years ago because it's 2024 next year 2025 will be the 17th 1700th 1700 anniversary of count the creed of nicaea okay so yeah 25 325c yeah, common era, absolutely, when Constantine was ruling, okay? This the Trinity is only a few centuries old before Muhammad and I. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Trinity in its formalized form is only 200, about 250 years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. About 400 years, at least 350 years before, uh, after Jesus. Isa Alaihi Wasallam has nothing to do with it. He did not preach it. He did not teach it. He did not tell it. He did not say it. It was the making of Christians who had become Christians in the Roman world, Greco-Roman world. Greco-Roman world means uh, the world that was influenced by the Greek uh, history and culture and the Roman culture. So these Greco-Roman thinkers who had become Christians imposed Greco-Roman thought and, the, uh, and, and philosophy on a religion that was for the Israelites. It was primarily an Israelite religion. Jesus did not come for the Romans. He categorically states in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 24, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I wasn't sent for anyone else. Later on, it was claimed on his behalf that no, he was actually sent for the whole of humanity. And uh, there is another verse in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, that Jesus is alleged to have said, go in the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he never taught that. Because if he did, later on 
in the book of Acts, we are told his disciples were baptizing people in the name of Jesus only. Not God the Father, not the Holy Spirit, Jesus only. So clearly there's a problem somewhere. Someone's making things up and adding them into the text of the Bible, right? So cut the long story short, this is a very huge topic. I want to recommend a book for those who want to study what happened here exactly in 325 CE. And I believe this is very likely to be the site where those debates took place. The bishops stayed here for months, for days, okay? And they would come here and they would, they would debate every day. And then Constantine actually forced all the bishops to sign up to one creed that was issued here in 325 CE, even though majority of the bishops were against it. They did not want to sign. They were forced by Constantine to sign. Two people did not sign. Arius and another bishop. I forgot his name, right? They were banished. They were banished. They were exiled. And the remaining bishops, about 318 bishops, they signed, signed up to the creed. And then to cancel this creed, another council was held elsewhere, okay? And a larger number of bishops attended and they condemned the Council of Nicaea, which is not talked about very much in history because this was the creed which was later on upheld by later Roman emperors because they were Trinitarians like Theodosius and other, other councils were kind of brushed under the carpet. Oh, they're, they're not important. Even though a larger number of bishops attended those, uh, those uh, councils, they were brushed under the carpet. So to see all, all these details, J.N.D. Kelly, J. N. D. Kelly, and the book is A History of Early Christian Doctrines. It's a very, very important book to understand how these Christian doctrines were developed historically. Okay, on that note, are there any questions? Inshallah. So this is just the remains. Over this is what remains. If you zoom in uh, uh, to, on these rocks just behind the grill, you will see, yeah, this, this looks like a square, but it's actually a basilica. So if you look at it from top, if you have an aerial view, you will see the shape, which is exactly the shape of a basilica. There is an altar, okay, and it's like a square or rectangular shape. Uh, it was a church. It was a church, and it is since gone, unfortunately. It's been vandalized or because water came up, and it was underwater, so maybe it was abandoned over time, and people took the building materials from it. Maybe blocks and rocks and bricks were taken away for building elsewhere. This is what uh, this is what happened to many of many ancient sites in the world. Other than the Greek influence, or is there any physical benefit for the Constantine to push this thing on? Yes, there is physical benefit for Constantine. Benefit? Constantine pushed for this creed because he wanted to uh, unite the Christians. Okay. He he was not interested in the in the theology. He wasn't very learned in it. He said, "To hell with your theology. To hell with your differences. I want a united." Christian community in my realm so that I can I can rule uh, in peace and I can use you guys for my ends right so Constantine was a politician he was an emperor he didn't want them to fight each other uh, because there was a, there were a lot of divisions and he had allegedly become a Christian by this time right because he had the vision uh, before the battle of Melvin bridge it's a very famous anecdote uh, that he saw a vision uh, and he saw the cross on the horizons and that's why he accepted Christianity so these are claims made but it is said that on his deathbed he basically effectively disowned what happened here because he was baptized on his deathbed by a bishop called uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia Eusebius of Nicomedia was an Aryan he was against the conclusions of what happened here, where Jesus was declared to be God with capital G. Aryans did not agree with that. Aryans were of the opinion that Jesus was simply a creation of God. He was not. If, if he's created, then he cannot be God. This was the logic. If Jesus was created, if he has a beginning, which he did, then he cannot be God because God does not have a beginning. Right? That was their logic. So Constantine died an Aryan Christian. This is why Constantine's successor, his very son Constantius, was an Aryan Christian. Yes. And another powerful emperor after Constantius was called Valens. He was also an Aryan Christian who died on the battlefield uh, in Adronopole, current day Adirne, in uh, 378. He was killed by the Goths. And then after him came Theodosius, 
who changed everything, who adopted the Trin Trinitarian view, who was uh, somehow hijacked or convinced by the Trinitarians, and he pushed for that, and he made it into law. If you do not believe in the Trinity, you will die. The Roman Empire will fall on you. So it was now illegal to believe in anything but Trinity. Okay? So I think that's a very good summary of uh, what happened uh, at Nicaea. So this is Nicaea. That's where the Council of Nicaea is likely to have taken place. And uh, this is where Constantine's palace was. This is a very beautiful place, very relaxing. I know why Constantine would have built a palace here. Uh, and uh, avoid the people swimming, please. Uh, uh, I'm speaking to the cameraman because, uh, you know, just uh, we don't want that to be in the video. And you can see it's all surrounded by mountains. So this was a summer chilling place, as they say. You know, this is where he would come and do his business in, more, in a more relaxed environment. I, uh, imagine Constantine had to come here to relax. So even at his time, Constantinople was... Uh, was busy. Uh, how how about today? It's 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 so much, or too much. Okay, thank you so much. And now we will make our way to Sogot to look at Ghazi Artogrul's tomb, and then inshallah on to Bursa. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.